I don't think he did it. I'm just going to say it. I don't think he did it. Alex Murdoch is on trial for murdering his wife and his kid in South Carolina's low country. And it is a barn burner of a trial. When details come in, you're probably going to, you know, you know, try to scrape your tongue off off the floor because it's crazy. The whole case is crazy. But it is often said that the case is won or lost in opening statements. And if that's the story today, then I don't think he did it. And I don't know if I'm like the 12 people sitting in the jury box in that room, the South Carolina folks who were all picked and finalized and actually listened to the prosecutor and the defense attorneys as they laid out their roadmap for the case. But if I were sitting in that jury box, I think that prosecutor's got an uphill battle. Prosecutor did uh, drop a few nuggets today, stuff we'd never heard before. And that's why Brian Enton is live with me now, our senior national correspondent who is an ace at this kind of stuff and has listened to every moment of what happened in the courtroom. You don't have to weigh in on that because you're a reporter. But I'm going to tell you right now, uh, either those were amazing jazz hands by the defense attorney or the prosecutor just didn't bring enough for me to believe that a man would take a gun to his own son's head and then his wife. It just wasn't strong enough. And yet I thought the defense was pretty strong. Tell me the stuff that we that we learned we didn't know. Yeah, there were a few uh, interesting new things that came out from the prosecutor in his opening statements. First of all, gun residue. Uh, we knew that it existed, but he says that it was found in various places, including uh, inside a rain jacket, uh, he says, that belonged to Alec Murdoch. He says that's going to be an important part of the case. Also, um, that Paul uh, was shot before Maggie. Paul, uh, Alec's son, was shot before his wife. That is something new. Uh, and this cell phone evidence, uh, the prosecution claims that they were able to ping Alec Murdoch and actually trace him to the murder scene. It's going to be interesting the way all of that plays out uh, when they start to really present all of the details. Uh, they also spoke in really graphic detail, both sides, uh, about how brutal these killings were. Uh, listen to the prosecutor in opening. The evidence is going to show it was a million to one shot. He could have survived that. But after that, another shot went up under his head and did catastrophic damage to his brain and his head. The evidence is going to show that Paul collapsed right outside that feed room. And just moments later, just moments later, he picked up a 300 blackout which is a type of ammunition, but an AR-style rifle. And the evidence is going to show that the family had multiple weapons throughout the property, picked up that 300 blackout rifle, and opened fire on his wife, Maggie, just feet away near some sheds that used to be a hangar. The defense, of course, then went on to talk for about 30 minutes and tell the jury also about how brutal the killings were, but trying to make the point that how could a father... Uh, do something like that, uh, something, something so, so brutal. Ashley? Well, and you know what? Uh, when the defense attorney, Dick Harputlian, uh, did his South Carolina courtroom presentation, it was like, you know, it, it, it's going to be a movie. It's got to be. I was wondering, because we're not allowed to look at the jury, right? If you're watching on TV, you're not allowed to see the jury, but reporters can. Any read on how they took in the story from the prosecutor versus how they took in the story from the defense? It's a good question. To us, they appear to be paying very, very close attention. Uh, we didn't get a sense of them sort of getting a feeling one way or the other. I mean, it was interesting. They were pretty short. I mean, I thought the openings would go longer. Uh, each side spoke for like a little less than 30 minutes, so it wasn't a really, really long time. They paid close attention. Uh, it was over. Uh, they let them go early, and then uh, testimony will start tomorrow. I was, I hadn't even got my lunch. You know, I, this has happened so fast. The jury yeah. was picked faster than I thought. The openings were faster than I thought. Brian, let me bring another uh, friend into the conversation. Nima Romani is a former federal prosecutor, also president of the West Coast trial lawyers. And Nima, I wanted to get your read as well, because I mean, I just love openings and closings. I like the test, the trial, the testimony phase and evidence phase, but, but I really love openings and closings. And as openings go, I feel like Dick Harputlian just gets it, right? I just think he gets who he was talking to. He gets the South Carolina courtroom. He gets this community, the low country. And I feel like he 
laid out a case that made sense. And his client cried while he described the horrible injuries to his client's son. And to me, that meant a lot. Is it just me because I'm too into trials and maybe the jurors aren't? No, Ashley, it's not just you. The defense has the advantage in cases are won or lost on opening. And today, the defense won, and this is why. I mean, a lot of the evidence that we were waiting to hear, the Snapchat video, that helps the defense, the lack of blood splatter, the forensic, even the cell side evidence. So I really was hoping that the prosecution would come out strong. I'm a former prosecutor. I think he did it, but it doesn't matter what I think. It's what the prosecution can prove. It's true. And then there was one weird thing, and maybe, Brian, you can help us understand what happened. You know, you don't like to interrupt openings or closings, and you don't like to do any objections either. There was there was that, both. But there was an objection and an interruption. I'm more interested in the interruption. The judge actually left the courtroom in the middle. I think it was like midway through the prosecutor's opening. Do you have any idea what happened? Yeah. Yeah, that is such a good question. That was one of the number one questions today I saw on Twitter. We don't know. It seemed like perhaps someone handed him a note he was gone just for a couple of minutes. I don't think they like officially even took a recess. He just said, hold on a minute, left, came back in and started up again. But there were even some lawyers in the courtroom sitting, uh, sitting just watching who said they'd never seen that happen ever before. All right, so Nima, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because um, mood, impression, uh, what feels right, what doesn't feel right, is often how a juror will make a decision, right? Gut, a gut check. And to that end, both of these attorneys we're after that. Number one, because the body cam is going to be played tomorrow, and I can't wait for that. And it's going to show uh, the demeanor of Alec Murdoch when the police first arrive. And, you know, they're going to suggest, the prosecutors are going to suggest that ain't right. That just ain't right for a guy who just lost his wife and kid, right? Just discovered them dead. But the defense has already said in this courtroom to this jury, you know what? He had just lost his wife and his kids. And these guys show up. The cops show up with a body cam. He's already grabbed a rifle in case the killer's still around. And immediately he feels like they think he did it. They, he thinks they think right away he's the killer. So how would you act? Is that brilliant or is that par for the course, the way the defense attorney sort of made sure that they had that in their head before they see the body cam? Ashley, it's really defense lawyering 101. It's a rush to judgment attack the investigating officers, right? And the defense seems to like that 911 video and that 911 recording and the video because they talked about it a lot during opening. They said, you know, they find Alex Murdoch, he can't even load his weapon, right? Even though he's an avid hunter. So I think the defense has done a good job painting Alex Murdoch as a widow or someone who has lost his wife and his oldest son, right? Whereas if you're the prosecution, you want to dirty him up. You want to focus on those financial crimes, show that he's a liar and a cheat. And I don't think they did a good job doing that today because that's the whole motive for this, right? They're saying that Alex did this to gain sympathy and draw attention to a hearing that was just going to happen in a few days that was going to expose him and subject him to financial ruin. Yeah, I just thought there was going to be a whole lot more coming, and I didn't get it. I thought there'd be so much more to that motive. You don't have to prove motive, motive but, but jurors want it. They just, they want to connect that dot. Okay, I got to leave it there. Brian Enton, thank you. And Nima Romani, thank you. I hope you'll come back again. Thanks.